Hello, our friends online from around the world. Good morning from Taipei. This is Elisa Chu. I am the founder and CEO of Anchor Taiwan, a platform to bridge the gap between the world with Taiwan, focusing on corporate innovation and cross-border collaboration. I'm also your host for the session today. We're going live directly here from the global headquarters of DigiTimes, a leading research platform and news platform for the global ICT industries since 1998. It is my absolute honor to have the founder and president of DigiTimes, Coley Huang, to talk about the disconnected ICT supply chains. Coley has been one of the most successful media executives, a veteran ICT analyst, and a best-selling author with more than 35 years of experience. When he founded DigiTimes in 1998, he was supported by 50 top industry leaders in IT and semiconductors, including the founders of TSMC and Acer. Throughout the years, he has been an advisor to many governments and organizations, including the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Taipei City governments. He has also worked with many top-tier ICT firms, such as Microsoft, TSMC, Huawei, Samsung, uh, Acer, and so on and so forth. I can go on and on and on to talk about his incredible accomplishments, but I know you all want to hear from him directly. So without further ado, Koli, would you like to say hi to our audience and also tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor. Uh, it's my great honor to share my observation about the ICD industry supply chain during COVID-19. Yes, and I know that for Koli, you have a very unique language and also educational background because I think in the ICT industry, not many people can speak three languages, including Chinese, obviously, Mandarin, yes. Taiwan. Well, actually, you speak probably four. Yes. Taiwanese. I speak four. <laughs> English and also Korean. Can you tell us a little bit about that unique background? And also because at the time, because of that unique language and cultural background, yes. you had a very unique position to observe you know, like what happened at the front line, especially when the ICT sector started to develop in both Korea and Taiwan. Yes, it's, it's unique. Uh, I sp actually, I speak four languages, but unfortunately, English is the worst. <laughs> so if you don't end understand my English, please raise your hand. I, I can speak Mandarin. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I had stayed in Korea for two years, mm. so I speak Korean fluently. And absolutely, I'm native Taiwanese. I speak Taiwanese as well, Mandarin. So it's a great talent, good talent for me to understand whole Asia Pacific especially. So over 35 years, I dedicate and focus on Asia, Asia Pacific ICT supply chain especially. Mm -hmm. So during uh, COVID-19, especially in January this year, I try to understand CES, yeah. what happened in the, in, in the major events for mm. electronic industry especially. But you know, end of January, uh, Chairman Xi Jinping, he, he, he said, we need to uh, prevent the, the pandemic and, and we need to, to know how to handle the country with a new way, something like that. But in my mind, you know, you know, most of the Taiwan CEOs, they come back to Taiwan and uh, for Chinese new, Lunar new, new Year. Mm. So they came to see me and they asked me questions about the ICT supply chain. So yeah. that's why that's the reason I try to organize all of the most up-to-date information and try to publish in English Then let the people understand mm. what happened in Asia. Yeah, definitely. I think with your unique language capacities, you yes. have a very... Um, kind of like valuable perspectives in mm. terms of what happened. And as far as I know, when you first came back from Korea, that was like in the 80s? 85. In 1985. Yes. And that was also the time that a lot of science parks yes. in Taiwan started yeah. to develop. Yeah. Uh, you witnessed that whole birth and development of our science park developments. Can you also tell us a little bit about that involvement and what you see in terms of our science part, what can we offer for the world? I always say that I'm a lucky guy because you know the year when I come back to Taiwan was the uh, high tech industry taking off year of Taiwan. Mm. 85 was the first year for personal computer because Microsoft launched Windows mm. and uh, at that time Taiwan government has uh, smart officials 
they recruit 20 young men to formulate strategy for the country. Yeah. And I'm one of them. Ah. So I was assigned to Central Science Park to try to get the information to formulate strategy for the science park. Let's say maybe you didn't know that. Today, in only in Central Science Park, we have 150,000 employees wow. work there. Such a tiny um, city, very small also one. Very small district, one. actually. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, for the audience who may not be so familiar with Taiwan, Xinzhou and Taipei is about one hour yes. apart yes. from each other, which is kind of like Silicon Valley in San Francisco. Yes. And over there, we have the science park that has the headquarters of many important companies around the world, like TSMC, UMC, tons of very important ICT companies. Not only that, before year 2000, about 85 to 90 percent of the noble PCs mm -hmm. produced between Taipei and the Xinzhou. There's one hour distance. Wow. I mean, 85 mm. percent worldwide. You know, high, highest record uh, we create in Taiwan uh, is was about 1999 or year 2000. Monthly, we produce 12 million units of noble PC. 12 million. That's mm. a big deal. So we need to ship to overseas through Taiwan International Airport. Mm. So you may didn't know, every air cargo, 747, they carry 25,000 units of noble PCs. And uh, which means every month we need 50 flights. Yeah. And the Taiwan Evergreen and the China Airlines combined together for the air cargo. Mm. We are biggest uh, air cargo fleet in the world. Wow. So hard to believe, y you know. Only one hour distance, mm. 60 kilometers about, then we have the huge industry. Mm. And uh, I'm very happy to share with our audiences all over the world. Until the end of last year, in Taiwan, we have 800 listed electronic companies. Yes. Even we only count those companies together, our revenue as big as seven. 12 billion US dollars. Wow. This is mm. a big deal. Uh, as far as I know, many of them have very huge cash balance as well. Yes. You know, like basically ready for a lot of um, investments and also R&D yes. for the high tech yes. sector. Uh, based on 712 billion US dollars, mm. this I didn't count the revenue from Microsoft, Intel, Samsung, uh, multinational companies, they, they do business in Taiwan. I only count the listed company yeah. in Taiwan. And uh, about 60% of them, they contribu contribute for mass production, like mm. Foxconn, like uh, Quanta, like uh, Compel, like, like uh, Wishong, Advantech uh, Inventech as mm. well. And uh, we also have about 100 billion dollars, the revenue created by semiconductor industry. Yes. So people know we have a very successful TSMC, UMC, mm. And uh, we also, we are, we, are, we are the second largest one actually design site in the world. Mm. Just the uh, second of uh, si uh, San Jose. Yeah. So we work with uh, design house, well we work with uh, system house closely. Then we know, the, we know hap what happened in ICT supply chain. Mm. That's why there is a motivation to motivate me, uh, encourage me to write this book, to share with uh, uh, our global audiences for that kind of thing. Yeah, especially during COVID-19. Obviously, our world looks very different now. Yes. I think a lot of different parts of the world, they're still trying to battle yes. this pandemic. So yeah. I think this book is really, truly timely because a lot of our partners and friends from around the world, especially in the supply chain sector, they're very concerned. What will the new normal be? And I think this unique perspectives from Asia hopefully will be useful for them for their reposition for the next sort of like phrase. And speaking of, you know, like we, we talk a little bit about the semiconductor, this whole supply chain sector is huge and it's also very complicated, very complex yes. for a lot of people. We promise that we're gonna share a little bit of your secret sauce because 35 years of experience, you have basically a certain framework to dissect this sector. And I was particularly interested in, I think on the, in the book, yes. you have this five by three matrix. It's on page 23, this matrix. It's very interesting. You seem to divide or basically put this whole ICT main areas into semiconductor panels and production base, and further divide them into five different market segments. 
um, communications, computing, home appliance slash, I guess, consumer electronics, and also the future of cars, um, industrial PC, and defense. Can you walk us through a little bit in terms of how you usually, you know, like with so many companies around the world in this sector and so many different segments, how do you even start? Like, let's say, if I want to have a more macro and overall view in terms of looking at the whole situation. As a senior analyst, I say 35 years ago, yeah. we can, I can say I'm a senior one. Especially, I started from scratch. And uh, I need to walk around, uh, look around, and uh, co work with uh, industry leaders of Taiwan, and uh, not only Taiwan, actually uh, with uh, many Asian bases, mm. uh, high tech entrepreneurs. And uh, from my point of view, every region has their own strengths. Mm. I mean, based on the global trends, I'm very happy to take references from like Gartner Group, IDC, iSpy, IHS, uh, others. And uh, based on this kind of perspective, then we know global basis, semiconductor is revenue as big as $420 billion, mm. about. So that we can identify into five different categories. Yeah. First one will be communications, then com computing devices, then home appliances, future cars, industrial PCs as well. Mm -hmm. But taking the top two, I mean communications and computing devices, they contribute about 70% worldwide. Mm. But the rest of the consumer electronics, uh, future cars, or industrial PCs, they also contribute about 30%. Yeah. And 10% in in yeah. individually. Mm. But we need to know, competition is not only for today, but mm. also for the next five years, 10 years, competition or cooperation even. So we need to think about the rest of the 30% even more important than the, the, the uh, mature computing devices mm. or communications. But absolutely, we need to understand up-to-date information, the, the real-time information. So we need to know how many units going to ship to the market from supply side, from upstream industry. And they o we also need to know servers and the noble PC because, you know, home economy, yeah. they create new opportunities. You know, in the second quarter, third quarter this year, I believe every quarter Taiwanese companies ship about 50 million units of noble PC to the market. Mm. But first quarter was not good because this connected IT supply chain, yeah. supply chain. But you, we also need to understand what's going on in the mobile phone market. Mm. Now based on this kind of information, and especially based on the component supply side, Asian Pacific base, only, uh, I mean research companies, research firms, they have different angles to understand worldwide trend. So Taiwan taking this kind of position, as yeah. I mentioned, 90%, actually speak frankly, Dish Times hard copy subscribers, we are huge, we are big one, yes. big size, uh, printed hard copy newspaper. 88% of our hard copy subscribers located in Shinzu and the Taipei mm -hmm. area. It's one hour distance. Yes. So Taiwan is easy to access that kind of information mm -hmm. and get it together and uh, to share with you. Yeah, certainly. And you know, like you talk about basically from PC to now home appliance, smart homes, opportunities around yes. there, and also future cars, yes. which only accounts for about 10% for the semiconductor yeah. now, and also industrial PC as well, only about 10% too. But it seems like those are the areas that might actually become much bigger. And I think, you know, like the developments of 5G and AI and so on and so forth will also feed into those areas as well. As I know, traditional passenger cars, mm. they only contribute 500 US dollars from semiconductor about. Mm. But in the future, future cars like electric car, it, it now it's about 800 US dollars. Mm. So that is, that is different. And uh, secondly, I would like to emphasize one thing. Most of the tech giants of Taiwanese company, in the first quarter, second quarter, when they share with their stake stakeholders, they always say, we are going to have a bigger sh share from car electronics. Mm. So there's, there's a new mega trend. As I mentioned, absolutely, we need to take care of the orders from Apple, HP, Dell. That's for communications, that's for uh, computing devices. But we also need to think about the future opportunities. Yes. So I believe most of the tech giants of Taiwan, they're preparing for that kind of opportunities. But that kind of opportunities not only focus on China, 
for America, but also for South Asian countries. Yeah, and you touch up on actually a topic that I'm very interested in, because we all know that Taiwan started as a PC kingdom. So yes. we used to manufacture the majority of the PCs and laptops around the world. And over the years, we have transitioned into mobile phones. Even now, we still have a lot of major suppliers for Apple, um, Taiwanese companies. You seem to believe um, in the book that the next trend or the next most important sector is going to be related to the cars because the car is going to be essentially kind of like a big computer yes. around the streets. Third one. Mm. Yes, mm. Yeah, the mm. third um, mm. computer around the streets. I'm curious, actually, what do you see when it comes to the global automotive industry? China, US, rest of the world, and Taiwan, can you share a little bit with us in terms of kind of like opportunities and trends that you are seeing? As I mentioned, I traveled to China more than maybe 100 times. Mm. So the first time was 1990. Actually, I was uh, appointed to become the first speaker between both sides of Taiwan Strait, ah. a formal seminar. I introduced how Taiwan succeeds in the industry. That was 1990. So after that, I traveled to more than 100 major cities over the country. And uh, I share with uh, provincial senior officials or industry leaders to share with them how we, we, we watch in this, this kind of industry. Mm. But I'm, I'm very happy to let you know, we can identify the new generation electronic industry in two, three different categories, in different phases. Mm. For, uh, phase one, from 1985 to year 2000. Yeah. There was a PC stage. Most of the electronic industry, I mean PC-based industry, actually located in Taiwan. As I mentioned, 90% from Xinzhou and Taipei area. Mm. And uh, we have design house based on the motherboard, based on the noble PCs. Then we have a very successful IC design industry in Taiwan. But ev after year 2000, mm. China get into WTO, China open their door and uh, attract people, attract multinational companies with the social cost and the levels as well. And uh, from year 2000 to year 2020, we can identify the industry as a mobile stage. Mm. There's a different stage. And also, China getting, getting rich, they have the welfare, then they can buy more devices. So China become the largest one market, not only PC, but also mobile phone or others. Today, if we count, worldwide market is about 1.4 billion units and the 400 billion close, mm. and uh, they, they're created by China market. Mm. And another one billion is beyond China, outside of China. So we can take different angles to think about the worldwide trends. Mm. So local China, what happened in, in, in there? And uh, people maybe didn't know that. Among the top 10 mobile phone brands, seven of them not from China. Mm. So we need to understand big market, huge market also attract people and uh, build their own industry by themselves. Mm -hmm. But after year 2020, because G2 issues, yes. China, US China trade war, and secondly, we also need to, need to consider AIoT, I mean, new stage for IoT. And uh, this is different from before. Mm. And I, I always say that, I always say that the PC stage and the mobile stage, there was a top down approach because we get orders from Apple, we get orders yeah. from, from HP, Dell, or, or Sony. But now we need to think about the button-up approach mm. because people need to understand how to based on 4G, 5G environment to create more opportunities. Mm -hmm. So believe, believe it or not, now 49% of the unicorns from American-based company yeah. and the 24 from China but we still have some from Southeast and Asian mm. countries, like uh, Graft, like uh, Gojek. They're also very successful from this field. What kind of devices they need? And uh, from, from Silicon, Silicon Valley perspective, they always say that AI will beat software, software will beat hardware. They just look like, uh, sounds like good. Mm. But taking different appro approaches to think about that. Yes, hardware looks like it's not available like before, but we, we don't have room for, for error. Mm. We need everything successfully. And uh, they, they need experience. They need a reliable 
supply chain. Yes. There is uh, not only PC, mobile phone, but also for the future cars. Yeah, and you touch up on the fact that China now is not only the world's factory, it's yeah. also the world's market as well, one of the most important ones with seven out of 10 mobile phones brands from, from China. As far as I know, even in the car industry, especially with electric vehicles, a lot of major battery companies are actually also from China as well, and they also have the very valuable rail air um, materials for that particular industry. Can we drill down this a little bit further? You know, if we look at the global automotive industry, how does it look like? Um, what's China's role in this? Like, are they basically going to be the most important player in this? Are they now, what's the, what's the market shares and also what's the current situation, especially how is that whole industry sort of like was affected by the COVID-19? You know, last year I conducted a survey about IC consumption in China. And uh, I believe China contributed about 58% of worldwide semiconductor consumption. Mm. That's a big deal. And 36% from local industry and the local market as well. What means for that? Like uh, demands from uh, Huawei, Lenovo, or Xiaomi, mm. Oppo, Vivo as well. There, there's a consumption and the domestic market uh, needs. And the 22% contributed by Foxconn, Compel, mm. Samsung, Sony, or other multinational companies, they have factories in China. So there's a portfolio today, as I know. But in the coming years, I, I believe the structure will be changed mm. because it's something to do with the car industry in the future. Today, you know, all our basis, we have about 78 million units uh, vehicles produced every year. Yeah. And 33% uh, about produced in China. So one third, about one third. One third, third about. Yeah. But there is a traditional passenger car. Mm. But for electric, electric car, as I know, 48% 48 produced so in China. Half. Yeah, almost half. So on our basis, we, uh, last year, we have 2.2 million new vehicles, electronic vehicles produced yeah. uh, over the world. Mm. But as I say, 48% produced in China. So if the game lure didn't change, if the mega trends just like before, mm. and uh, yes, and China will become even more important. Yeah. You know, battery, battery is the is most important part for electric car. They contribute more than 40% of the cost. Mm. And uh, which country is the most successful in battery industry? China. Yeah. Top 10 battery producers, six of them, they're from China. Mm. So we need to understand there's a portfolio and the structure of the future car today. But I believe one thing. Today, traditional passenger cars, they may have 30,000 components. Mm. But in future cars, I mean elec electronic car, electric car, they may only have 185, 8900. Mm. So we need to think about production systems more easier, uh, simple than before. Yeah. And I believe the countries like Vietnam, India, Indonesia, even Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, they are going to have their own industry. So GM not only produced in China. Today, mm. more than 45% of the GM cars produced in China. Mm. But I believe GM will move to India, move to Vietnam or other countries, especially in Asia. But the question is, who can help to build the infrastructure for mass production in the future? Mm. So Taiwan taking the position, and absolutely Korea is very important. But Taiwan and Korea is different. You know, now profit-wise, Samsung is even 10 times than LG. Mm. And uh, think about uh, Hyundai automobiles. There is a different way in the future cars. So oh, everyone got, gets new challenges. But we need to think about how to work together. And uh, yes, I believe Taiwanese companies have to go to North America mm. to have Canadian-based company, American-based, even Mexico company to build their own cars because components from electronic side. Yeah. But also, we, we, we need to become a bridge or a springboard for Western-based companies to come to South Asian countries because mm. you need to get into mass production. As I say, who can handle that? Mm. Yeah, and you know, this whole car industry, we also have seen, as Colleen mentioned, because a lot of 
major international uh, automakers um, basically now manufacture in China, or they rely hugely on components from China. I'm also curious, do you see differences in between the degree of that reliance in between, let's say, the US and the rest of the world, like Japan, um, Germany, say for example, they all rely on the automotive industry hugely, which contributes to around like 10% of their GDP. Yes, but so. then it seems like they have different reliance on China. And what's your view? Like, do you think in the future, the supply chains around this area will get more and more localized, or how how do we even try to understand this situation and the future trend? You know, in Taiwan, we we have say we always say we have top uh, we have six or five top top tech giants mm. in Taiwan, like yeah. Foxconn, Compel, We Strong, uh, Advantech, yeah. or, or uh, Inventech, mm. Compel. I met uh, We Strong chairman recently. Mm. He say within ten years the value from traditional passenger cars will reduce to thirty percent, mm. and uh, you you can understand that Bosch the CEO say no motivation, no movement from traditional car industry. Mm. So we need to think about how to create new opportunities. Yes, that, that is one thing. Secondly, today maybe car industry market as big as five trillion US dollars, mm. but only. You know, only 48% uh, from car sales. I mean, s car sales yeah. directly. Mm -hmm. But in the coming 10 years, I mean, 10 years later, we will we'll reduce to 38. Mm. Where well, we can create a new value for that? Local services. Yes. Because connected cars. Mm. So, we, as I mentioned, we need to co work with uh, local giants, local kin, to co work with them. So, based on two different approaches one is services, one is production. So the companies like uh, Reliance in India, mm. like TVS in India, they have electronic background. If they co-work with Taiwan, like Ven Vietnam, FIP, the if they co-work with Taiwan to build the, the, the uh, mass production system, that's good for their country. Taking the position of Taiwan, Taiwan had to think about uh, this is a huge investment. Mm. We can uh, handle everything by ourselves. As a human being, I encourage Taiwanese companies to go abroad to build or to create to get job opportunities for emerging countries. Yeah. You know, year 2008, I still remember. Before economic crisis, American unemployment rate was 4.8%. Mm. And they climbed up to 11%, then yeah. down to 4.7 again. Mm. It took about seven years. But today, unemployment in not only America, Italy, India, mm. even Israel, mm. and, and uh, Singapore. So we need to think about how to help emerging countries create job opportunities and market opportunities for like a, a silicon-based company. Then they can create opportunity and work together. Mm. So based on PC and the mobile industry experience, for top-down approaches, this is a linear supply chain. We yeah. take orders. Yeah. We, we took orders from Apple, from HP. This is a linear supply chain. Mm. But today we have to think about the metrics. Mm. We need sometimes we co work, sometimes we compete. But for, for future, we even have to think about seamless, seamless supply chain. Yeah. So smart logistics, smart manufacturing getting more important. Mm. And this I do believe in the seven nanometer factories. Every minute, they have eight million instructions. You mean like uh, factories like TSMCs? Yes. Eight million? Yes. So every minute? Every minute. So you need to think about how complicated, how many IT people work in TSMC. Mm. And uh, around the TSMC, there's an ecosystem. So we have about 50 to 55 IC design companies. They are listed companies. In, in Taiwan, we have about 300 IC design houses, mm. but 50 of them, they are these companies. So we can trace back every company's performance, financial status, that's easy in Taiwan. Our, our government is very lousy. They, mm. they ask every company to, to release their financial reports monthly basis. Yes, which so is very different from most of the world. Oh, yes. Yeah. If you, you want to understand the Taiwan's status, that's easy. Because as I mentioned, 800 listed company, and uh, you can double check.
from upstream to downstream. Yeah. Just example. Mm. If you like to know how many Microsoft, uh, Sony, uh, PlayStation, yeah. they ship to the market. It's easy. You, you trace back to upstream component source, mm. then you know how many units they ship to the market. Sometimes you can get that kind of information. Yeah. Something like that. that that's why I think you know at the front line, you really have this a lot of insights that our friends from maybe the states or Europe or the other parts of the world are not able to see. So I'm, I'm also curious because these days, a lot of my friends and also partners in the States, they are very concerned about this whole decoupling situation. Yeah. Not only most recently because of COVID that accelerated this whole situation, but previously because of the US-China trade war, we're seeing basically, especially around the supply chain and also many other areas, the decoupling and divergence of the world's um, power and new positions, especially around semiconductor. It seems like these days everyone wants a piece of TSMC. So I guess you know both the US and China, even Japan and a lot of other places, they all want to build their own semiconductor supply chains. Do you think it's possible? And also I guess you know like as someone from Taiwan, should we or do we need to pick sides when it comes to this whole decoupling and, and especially on the semiconductor area? As a senior analyst I would like to emphasize one thing, human rights. Mm. We are human beings. So to keep the welfare for everyone is the reason why we work hard mm. to take people better life than before. So how to keep China prosperous? They didn't know they can get good life based on the technology and the global basic, global principles. So my idea is to keep the connection mm. with the uh, basic components transaction and the cooperation. And as I mentioned, as I mentioned before, at the end of last year, we have 50 some ICD houses mm. in Taiwan. Listed. Yes. I believe those companies are more commercialized technology, mm. not so cold, because American government may care about the uh, the, the most high-end technology, mm. they, they, they move to China. Ch Americans want to take the leadership continuously mm. and we support for them. But you know, China needs welfare. We need to help 1.4 billion population. Yeah. They enjoy good life. Mm. But taking the right approach to build the local market like before. Mm. So we have to help them. So trust me, my idea is to encourage Taiwan IC design industry to go to China continuously mm. and even leverage local IC design engineers work for new projects. But I just don't believe China can be, be develop semiconductor industry successfully mm. in the coming 10 years because semiconductor industry is not like panel, like a mobile PC or mobile phone. Mm. Because semiconductor industry, we can identify six different layers. Mm. First one will be EDA design tool, then IC design industry, and then foundry, mm. packaging testing, equipments. Then we have another one, distributions. Yes. That's not easy. So companies like uh, Avnet, Aero, they have big operation in Asia, especially in Taiwan. And uh, in Taiwan, we have a WPG, mm. the largest one component distributor in Asia. Their revenue are as big as twenty billion dollars. Mm. So now they are not only to help you to have the capability to run smart manufacturing, they run smart logistics. Yeah. They promise you if you order, they promise you to ship to you within four hours. Mm. They can run that kind of business with very low margin. But that's why Western society and the uh, Oriental markets or Oriental industry need to think about take different ways to think about a different uh, possibility for complementary cooperation. Yeah, it, it's very interesting actually because I guess previously when, when I hear a lot of discussions around TSMC, semiconductor, the trade war in between China and US, I haven't really heard of the perspectives to look at the collective well-being of the entire world, the population 1.4 million um, billion in China. How do we actually collectively 
as a human being, I guess, contribute to the global sort of like where it fell. So that's a, that's a very interesting perspective. I, I, I like to say Qualcomm heavily rely on Asia Pacific market. So we need to keep Qualcomm still very profitable. Mm. Not only for high end, they, they need to sell the middle low end products to the market. Asia Pacific market is big, but now if China market to create new opportunities for technology, then we need to think about different way. Mm. Elsa, do you know that? In June, June this year, the percentage of our 5G mobile phone, the country is more than 60% of the Chinese, Chinese local market now. Yeah. And uh, they even contribute 52% worldwide global basis sales. So China now is the most advanced market. They need different components. They, need, they, they have the opti business opportunities for global basis company. Mm. So we need to take different ways to think about that. Do you know Samsung is a big project in Xi'an? Mm. Maybe 15, uh, 15 billion US dollars investment over there. All of the equipment are getting to. Why Samsung didn't get up? So we need to think about we can try to balance that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. Some of the very sensitive technology. Mm, like related to national security, say yes, for example. Yeah, they, they, they yeah. Are, like I follow that kind of way. Mm. Uh, they, they kind of rules. Because every country, yes, especially now is a different, different stage. You know, uh, one and a half years ago, I published a book called First Island Chain. Mm. That is about Asian age. Age means two age. Yeah. One is ge geographic age. Mm. Second one is age computing. Mm. So there's are the different things about that. But my idea is, you know, during uh, Cold War stage, America and Russia compete. And who are in the front line? Who are in the front line? Japan, Korea, and Taiwan yes. were in the front line. But now Japan, Korea, and Taiwan again to become a front line for uh, US-China trade wars. Mm. But we have two key factors to have to think about that. One is semiconductor, second one is supply chain. Mm. And especially Korea and Taiwan taking significant position for the kind of things. Let's come back to the data center. Yeah. We need two different specialties. One is storage, one is high performance computing. Mm. So who provides storage memories? Especially oh. Samsung mm. and Hynix. Yeah. They are most important. And Toshiba as well, they mm. are also important as well. But who has the uh, high performance computing chips? Mostly from Silicon Base company, Silicon Valley base. Mm. But who produce for TSMC? Yeah. So we need to co-work for that kind of things. We still have the position and the room for that kind of things. Mm. But you know, everything, every industry, you know, not not only feature cars, not only consumer electronics. In my mind, I think industrial PCs or defense industry also has new. New, new opportunities for yeah. for thinking about the Asia Pacific and the co work with with the region. Yeah, and speaking of this whole Asia Pacific, so we, we talk a little bit about I guess with G two, U S and China, and how I guess you know like except for some highly sensitive components and applications, we should still think about how to co work with China. How about and you mentioned your last book about Asia Edge. Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. Since you are an expert uh, for, for Korea, we need to ask you about your views on Korea, especially, I guess, Samsung, and the differences in between Taiwan and Korea, pros and cons. What's, what's your take, especially if we were to look into the Samsung versus other players in this space? Yeah, Samsung at Korea and Taiwan play a significant role in supply chain and semiconductor. But we are different country. Mm. I mean, Samsung looks like has uh, brand names. They have the, the scale. They have the, the most advanced technology in semiconductor field. That is true. Mm. Samsung is very competitive and a very successful, successful, successful company. But the Samsung risk with something to do with the Korean economy. Mm. In Korea, the foreign date as high as 460 billion US dollars, and one third of them are short term mm. date. There is a ch challenge for yeah. Korea, especially in the economic crisis period. So, 1998 and in 2008, mm. Korea suffered from their economy. So, 
I, I cannot say Samsung will getting more conservative for future investments, but for challenge of whole career, there is a big challenge for them. Mm. Taiwan is different. Taiwan no foreign debt. Y y do you believe that? It's we, amazing. We, we don't have any. We don't have foreign debt. Mm. But we have foreign currency reservation as yeah. big as 480 billion dollars. Mm. We are number four, number five in the world. Yeah. But how to believe? Recently, why Taiwan stock market is getting higher and higher? Mm. Very good, good, pos good, good status. You know why? Because many overseas Taiwanese they they invest in China. They take money back. Mm. Not only China, but also South Asian countries. They, yes. they bring the money back to Taiwan. So. We, we, we have very good economic status now. Our challenge is Taiwan too conservative to invest. Mm. So I encourage them to go to South Asian countries to co-work with them. Yeah. Now, our challenge is too much money. Mm. Not only Taiwan, but also global because, you know, QE, something yes. like that. So how to share the, the financial resources with the South Asian countries? Mm to build the infrastructure to help them their, their own industry. I, I believe one thing. In the future electronic industries, we need to localize. Mm. We need to localize to help them and to, to get to, to, to help people to get more opportunity, job opportunities. Yeah. There is a global global trend for that. Mm. We we definitely see that trend and also need because of the COVID nineteen. Yeah. And we Talk about U.S., China, and also Korea a little bit. And I think mainly the message I'm getting is that the overall macroeconomic sort of like conditions are rather different. And also the capital market conditions are pretty different as yeah. well. But Samsung is still a yeah. very powerful yes, company. Yes. And you kept mentioning Southeast Asia and this whole Indo-Pacific region. So I guess you know we need to also get your take around that. It's an area with a lot of population as well. India alone has 1.35 um, billion, yes. which is almost the same as China. In addition to that, obviously, we have Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and, and so on and so forth. This whole region that's actually rather close to Taiwan because we're sort of like sitting yeah. at the center yeah. in Asia, you know, like to the north, to the south, to the east, to the, to the west all very easy for us to get to. And can you tell us a little bit more? So these days in India, well, these days especially we see a lot of news about our Foxconn, Petro, um, Pegatron, Wistron, they all are increasing their expenditure and also investments in India. In Indonesia, we're seeing quite a lot as well. Can you share a little bit in terms of what you are seeing, especially, you know, like you have the opportunity to have that front row seats with a lot of the chairpersons of these companies. What are you seeing in terms of the trends? And how can we, I guess the most important question would also be, then for our partners around the world, how can they take advantage of this? You know, SML, right? Why SML puts their service hub in Taiwan? Because it's easy to help, to, mm. to serve the companies in semiconductor companies in Japan, Korea, Shanghai, and the Taiwan, and Singapore as well. Mm. Because Taiwan is in the hub. It's easier for us to communicate. Yeah. And secondly, Taiwan has uh, has an industry. We have, uh, we have semi TSMC, we have uh, UMC as well, and uh, Mechonix, Winbong. We have many semiconductor manufacturers here. So mm. SML puts Taiwan as a service hub. That is true. That is right. But take a different way to think about geographic or advantage. Mm. Because if you fly from America to uh, San Francisco, you want to go to South Asian countries, you go through Taipei, mm. one hour shorter than to go through Hong Kong, mm. because we, we were in the rim of Pacific. Yeah. But South Asian countries, they are so different. Mm. And so may I ask you a question? What is the national name of India? India. <laughs> oh, my, my, my Indian friends told me. Yeah. No, no, no. Our national name is, is not India. Mm. We, our national name is United States of India. Wow, because there are so many different yes, states over there. Yes, they have 29 different yeah. states. They may have three different states, three major states that attract foreign investment successfully, like uh, Tamil Nadu, Chennai, mm. or Noida, close to, uh, close to De Delhi or Bangalore. Mm. They are successful to attract multinational companies to, to invest in India. But now, India should take different ways to think about their opportunities, their mm. position. 
So, you know, I met many minister, vice minister in Indian government. Mm. You know, the first time when I was in India was 1992. I traveled to India maybe 17, 18 times. So I, I traveled there many times. Mm. I have many good friends over there. I always try to convince them. I say, you don't need to subsidize Taiwanese company mm. because we are small and uh, we are manufacturers. So we need to keep profit, even thin margin. We, we, we know how to keep the business. But you need to help your local companies if they don't have the competitiveness to compete global basis. We cannot come because we cannot make profit. Mm. So nobody, nobody wants to go to India. So firstly, India government have to build their own domestic market. Mm. Secondly, you mean infrastructure or? Infrastructure investment like 4G, something mm. like that. And uh, also to encourage uh, like uh, education system, mm. like uh, engineers to, to, to share with others. Yeah. Just an example, as I mentioned, Taiwan is the second largest one ICT data industry over the world. Mm. If, if Indian talents to come to Taiwan to work, yeah. and they can go back to, to India, mm. they can take the opportunity, take the experience from Taiwan, and they can do their, their own business. So I, I just try to convince Indian uh, IIT, uh, Vice Minister uh, Tajakuma, Ajakuma, I, men I mentioned he is my good friend. I asked him, why, why you try to do uh, OLED or mini LED, micro LED? Mm. You, you can try LCD module in, in the beginning. Mm. You learn experience. And secondly, you have maybe 400 million families. Mm. And not all of the family needs 75 inch large screen TVs because space is small. So think about the local needs. Go back, this is the strength of India. Yeah. So from scratch, do it step by step. This is not only for India, but also good for South Asian countries. Mm. You know, we have 11 members of Asian countries. And uh, some of them, the population even bigger than 100 million, yeah. like uh, Philippines, mm. like Indonesia. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think Vietnam is very close to one, one, 100 yeah, million. I think 90, 95 million. Uh, 98, already. something like that. Yeah. Uh, they are young. Mm. And uh, they, are good. They, they know how to use mobile phone. They know how to, uh, how to tra tra transform the TV set into an uh, industrial PC, mm. something like that. Yeah. So wh when we talk about uh, smart home, we have to think about the two different gateways. One is refrigerators. Second one is TV sets because everyone going to have the face recognition. Uh, maybe we have storage, mm. we have uh, uh, some of the new features for that. So we need to co-work together because the new market is massive the market. Yeah. Not linear supply chain, as I mm. mentioned. There's a massive market. You need to help each other to go to the smart transportation, smart cities, smart cars, anyway. So that's my suggestion. Yeah, and because overall over there, I think, you know, like the population is in, in total in that region, more than 2 billion. Yes. And I think, you know, there's a huge part of the world that are waiting for digital economy and many of them can probably leapfrog in terms of this development. I guess the key message I'm also getting here is that, well, through all our questions from before, maybe this is not so much about decoupling and picking sides. Maybe this is about, hey, there, there's this huge emerging markets waiting to be served how do we collectively make it a bigger pie so that our friends and partners from the States, Europe, and other parts of the world can also collectively contribute to that local economy? You know, in the beginning, uh, I mean, February, beginning of February, when Hyundai, Hyundai mobile phone, uh, mm. no, 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 Hyundai cars, they come back for manufacturing, but they got some trouble mm. because why the harness? The cheapest uh. the parts from China, not only Hyundai, but the also supply yeah, chains. Yeah, Nissan. So, as I mentioned, we need to think about if the car manufacturing getting more easier, more simple. Mm. So localize all of the support will be a very important key. Mm. And this is also related with uh, local employment. There's a big challenge for every government. Yeah. So every, everyone needs to think about how to help unskilled laborers they get a job. Mm. If they don't, they don't opportunity to get a job. They don't have the money to buy a mobile phone. Mm, yeah. So there's th there's the things we have to think about that. Secondly, we have to cross the cultural barrier. Mm. 
And Risa, do you know how many Muslim in the world now? No 1.5 about, as I know. Billion. Yeah, sure. Mm. And how, how many people live in Indo-Pacific area? Probably half. 2.2. Oh, okay. I mean, includes uh, Eastern yeah. Africa. Mm. You may didn't know, many Eastern African countries, they have Indian, Indian background people mm. live there. So because, you know, Persian, yeah. they came back to different ways. One to go to India, one to go to Africa. Mm. And uh, some, uh, they are very close. So because we, uh, we, are, we are Oriental people, we may live in Korea, live in Japan, live in Taiwan. We don't think too much about the Middle East. Mm. But now we have to think about uh, how to fly to Africa. They have 1.4 billion population live there. And uh, Nigeria, they have 200 million population live there. Mm. And uh, the mobile phone penetration rate now is high, as high as 100%. Yeah. So we can sell mobile phone to them, mm. but we teach them, help them to build their own industry. Then mm. the, the market is getting, getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. We share all of the opportunities. Yeah. And with the cultural barriers, I think the key is obviously to look for the right partners to enter the new markets. And with a lot of Taiwanese suppliers already position themselves in the Indo-Pacific region, I suppose this is really a great time to think about how to collaborate more with them. And I love how I think Coley mentioned in the book that Taiwan is, you call it, a harmless partner. And I think you know, that's, really, that's really a great way to, to look at our position around the world. Uh, as I mentioned, Taiwan has a huge foreign currency reservation. Mm. So we, we're not a ego or try to encourage you invest in Taiwan with, with only money. You come here because value chain, mm. you need us and we also need you. Yeah. But take different way to think about that. You mentioned about students, maybe talents exchange. Yeah. Maybe we have one million overseas students, students uh, study over the world. And the thing about that, if 1,000 engineers walk in Taiwan to learn how Taiwan develop IC design, then they, they, they can go back to mm. India. What is the value for that? Mm. So I encourage people to study in Taiwan to learn the methodology and the infrastructure, mm. how we build the infrastructure yeah. for, for Taiwan and for China as well. Mm. Actually, you know, Ta China's success, that they, is related with Taiwan mm. investment. Definitely, in the begin yeah. In the beginning of 19, 1990s, mm. absolutely, China doing very well. But we need to think about the future. We, as a human being, as I mentioned, we, we need to care about the Indian welfare. Mm. We need to help the Filipino. We, have, we need to help Indonesia. Mm. This is the position of Taiwan can yeah, do. Yeah, mm. yeah. And I guess because Taiwan is small. Yes. So, you know, we, we cannot build all of these factories why ourselves, right? Yes. So we're harmless, but at the same time, we can export a lot of our know hows yes. to really sort of like work with the local governments for their employment, for their infrastructure, and to empower their digital economy.